Hi millionaires. The one question I get around this time of the year is how do I buy a home and what are they looking for? If you're trying to buy a house with your tax dollars or with your savings or whatever you have planned, watch this video. I got you. When it comes down to buying a home, you need to make sure that your credit is up to par. You do not need a 750 credit score to buy a home. You also don't need 100K to buy a home either. When I bought my home, me and my husband together made less than $70,000 a year. We got pre-approved for about $225,000 and that we could have got approved for a little more than that, except I had almost $40,000 of student loans showing on my credit at the time. I had one charge off still on my credit, my credit score was about a 670. My husband's credit score was about a 620. Now, when it comes down to your credit, you need to know that they take the median score of all three of your scores. So Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, if you have a 520, a 600, and a 750, they're gonna use the 600 because that is the median score of all three. Now, if you are buying a home with your partner, your spouse, a co-owner, what have you, I always tell people, whoever has the lowest score, that's what they're going to use. So mind you, they use, the, they grab the median score of yours. They grab the median score of theirs. So if your median score is, let's just say 650, their median score is 620. They take your six, their 620 and your 650, and they're going to use the lowest score out of the two of you. Now, is that fair? No. Do I think they should average it? Yeah, but I don't make the rules anyway. So you want to make sure that when you're buying a house, your lowest score, make sure that your lowest score is at least 620. So that way it doesn't really matter what your highest score is. As long as your lowest score is 620, they're going to take the one in the middle. I do feel like people look at the fact that, oh my God, on Treasury and I have a 750, but on, on, on Equifax, I have a 500 Experian, I have a 650. Well, you need to know that they're going to use that 650. Yeah. They're going to look at the other ones though. They're going to look at the other bureaus. They're going to look at if you have collections, if you have charge offs, if you have, you know, evictions, medical bills, they're going to look at all of that. One thing as of this video, medical bills do not count against you when it comes down to your debt to income ratio. So now that we got credit out the way, you do need to have good credit, but when it comes down to your credit, it does not have to be perfect. So on your credit, you can buy a home with student loans showing on your credit. You can buy a home with collections on your credit. The only issue is the more collections you have or the more bad debt you have, the more money and income you're going to need to have to supersede that because what comes into play is your debt to income ratio. You're going to hear that a lot. DTI, DTI, DTI through the home buying process. Your debt to income ratio is what going to is one of the driving factors of denials when it comes down to mortgages. This is why people say fix your credit. It does not mean go and get a, it doesn't mean you have to get a credit repair specialist. And I do have a book. I did write a book for y'all. Millionaire secrets is in the comments below. Grab the book, work on it yourself because there's nothing better than knowledge so that once you learn how to do it yourself, you never have to pay for someone to do it for you. Your debt to income ratio is going to be a, a driving factor in whether you're approved or denied. Like I said, yes, can you get, you know, a mortgage with student loans and bad debt? You can, but the less, the better. This is why I tell people, get those collections off your credit first. That not only helps improve your credit score, that also improves your chances of approval. It lowers your debt to income ratio because nine times out of 10, what's reported on your credit is not accurate anyways. When debt collectors are buying these debts, they're buying and paying for the debt in hopes that they recover their money. But the creditor that you owed originally, they're already paid. They're paid by the debt collector. That's why the debt collector be calling you 50,000 times. The bank stopped calling you after a while and now you, now you see account recovery recovery or some type of law office now owns this debt and now they're calling you and not the person that you originally owe. Why does that happen? Because debt collectors, they'll go, they go by debt in hopes that they tax it and, and add interest and all that and all that fees on it. And they hope that they recover it from you. They do the annoying work that the banks don't feel like doing. So do you really owe the debt collector? Mm, I don't know. Do you? So 
That's why I say repair your credit, learn about the FCRA laws, learn about your rights as a consumer. So that way you can get those negative items off of your credit. Your debt to income ratio is lower and then you're good to go. Because also even when it comes down to student loans, student loans are not always reported accurately. When it comes down to FCRA laws and consumer laws and stuff like that, things that are reported on your credit report, it has to be accurate. So why do things get removed from your credit report? Because inaccuracies, erroneous information, like inaccurate and negative information that is not even correct. You can see that you owe 30,000 in student loans over here. On one bureau, you might see 3105. On another bureau, you might see 3703. On another bureau, somebody's lying. So unless all three of them say the same thing, all three of them say the same um, date that it was closed or charged off or whatever, everything has to match across the bureaus. If one of them has some, some form of inaccuracy, that means that there's an inaccuracy in that reporting. And then that, had, that gives you the right to get it deleted from all of the bureaus and sometimes they don't even come back and try to fix it and put it back on there the correct way because they know that they didn't even buy most debt collectors don't even buy the debt correctly they don't buy all the information they need to even prove that debt in court which is why when you take these debt collectors to court let me do it i'll do another video about credit we're gonna talk about the mortgage anyways so yeah back to the mortgage so you got credit you got your debt to income ratio then you need tax returns they do have loans that don't require you to have tax returns but if you expect to do a conventional loan which is 20 percent down and no PMI every month or a FHA loan, which is three and a half percent down. That is usually your first time home buyers loan that you get where you only have to put down three and a half percent. However, you're going to pay a monthly PMI, which is just a um, kind of like a, a, a mortgage insurance. So not homeowner's insurance, nothing like that. It's a, it's kind of like a mortgage insurance where you didn't put down the full 20 percent. So you're kind of like putting it, you're paying that different every month. When you go the conventional route, yes, you put down way more, but you don't have that in your monthly. What do I think? I think you should do what's best for you, but I would highly recommend if you have not done the FHA loan, go ahead and do the FHA loan because there are parameters to where you can, when you can do it again. But when you do an FHA loan, you can always do a conventional right after that. You can always do a conventional after that, but there are rules to how long you have to be in your home before you can get another FHA loan. So I always tell people, if you have not used the FHA yet, use the FHA, go ahead and put down that three and a half percent. Um, and then that way you can, if you want to buy another house you can go to conventional route at that time you'll you'll kind of know the process a little better you can do a lot more so we talked about credit we talked about debt to income ratio we also talked about the types of loans they do also have va loans they have usda loans where you know you don't have to put down money they have different options you just should talk to a realtor in your local area that way they can point you to the right direction of a good um, lender that they might prefer so that way you the lender can help you um you know run your credit and they can see you know where you are and give you some pointers of how to get to that closing table now when it comes down to what all will you be paying for your home i feel like this is not talked about enough go ahead and get your pen and paper i got you to start the home buying process you're going to put down an escrow deposit that escrow deposit is going to be your deposit for your home now usually your escrow deposit is normally like one percent um but that changes it all depends on what the seller is willing to accept for that deposit so that deposit is considered it's called earnest money it's called earnest money i always say escrow deposit but it's earnest money so it's kind of like this is your earnest money to tell them like hey i'm serious i want to buy this house you putting up your earnest money as a courtesy to like say hey you know i'm serious like take me serious this kind of locks you in and it kind of takes that home off the market because you got your earnest money down right so you have your earnest money so let's just go with one percent then you have your inspection and you have your appraisal report. You need both of those. Uh, um, inspections, they can be anywhere from 300, they can be four, 500, it just all depends on your area, your state and all of that. Appraisals, they're normally around 600, 700, 800, they, they change. Again, it depends on your state, your area, your city, however. But those two things, like your earnest money is to start, your inspection, your appraisal is gonna happen so at some point during the home buying process. Once you're in underwriting and stuff, then they're gonna start requiring you to do these things. And I do feel like I wish I would have known that during my home buying process because I thought you just have your down payment. So three and a half percent, I did the math and that's that. I didn't think nothing about no earnest money. I didn't know nothing about an inspection and an, an appraisal and that I had to pay for it. Did not know that. Also, after that, you do have on the closing day, you will be paying your closing costs and your down payment. 
Now, if you have a good realtor, they can negotiate your closing costs, but it does not mean that you have a bad realtor if the seller decides they don't want to pay the closing costs. So you're, you're, you and your seller, like say if your closing cost is 6,000, just you can negotiate to where the seller pays half of the closing costs. Sometimes the seller may say, hey, I'll pay the whole closing cost. So now all you have to bring to the table on closing day is your down payment. But if you have to pay some portion of your closing costs, well, now that's when you kind of go into, you know, okay, you got the three and a half percent, but you also have closing costs and closing costs can vary. So that's why I said, you know, it just all depends on your transaction. No transaction is going to be the same. I can have a $300,000, $500,000, $600,000 house and all of my numbers and everything that I pay out may be different than what you pay out simply because my seller may require more earnest money up front. My seller may say, I'm not playing paying closing costs or I'm only paying half closing costs. Your seller may say I'm paying full closing costs. That's why I tell people your home buying journey is just yours. People can give you pointers and tips about how it's going to go, but you really won't know until you're in the process. However, taking it for what it is and knowing the things like earnest money, credit scores, appraisals, inspections, closing costs, down payments, debt to income ratio, these type of things, clear to close. Even hearing the words clear to close, like if you get a CTC, you know you're good to go. Like getting through underwriting and things that are conditions, you may go through underwriting and they may say, hey, I have a conditional approval. And in order to get a full approval, you may have to pay these credit cards down or you may have to, you know, get these things off of your credit first. That's a conditional approval. Or you can just get a flat out approval and it's like, okay, you um, underwriting cleared you, your credit looks good, your income looks good. Let's also talk about taxes. When it comes down to buying a home, they look at your last two years taxes. And that's what I forgot to go back to. Your last two years taxes, your um, bank statements, I believe for four to four weeks, depends on all, it depends on the lender. And also your last three months of bank statement. They can request more than that, but at the bare minimum, two years tax returns, um, last three months bank statements, and your last four week pay stub. Now, can you change jobs? Yes, you can change jobs. Should you change jobs right before you buy a house? No, you should not. But if it's in the same field and it looks like, you know, you went from one job and then you may have gotten a, um, a bonus or you may have gotten a better opportunity, those things are fine, but you just don't want to be doing too many changes right before that. Also, when you are in the home buying process and right before that, don't move money. Do not move money. They're going to be looking at the last three months bank statements. Don't try to hide money. Don't try to get nobody to put no money in your account. Don't do no cash outs, no Zells, no none of that. In the home buying process, you want to be very, 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 very strict with what's moving in and out of your account because any little thing looks like money laundering, you're done. Also, they do not cash. Don't be putting drops and lump sums and drops of cash in your account. That looks funny. Don't do it. Also, if you have, when it comes down to your taxes, I know, I know you, you probably wrote off all you're going to write off last year, but them schedule C's and all that on your, on your taxes, writing off so much so that you can get a big in, uh, income tax back. You might have to sit this year out, buddy. If you plan on buying a house because you, last year, okay, you did it. It's all right. This year, they're going to look at your last two. If they see that you wrote off a lot of stuff this last year, well, your income that was supposedly 50,000 looks like 20,000 and that AGI it matters when it comes down to buying a home it don't matter how much money you actually made when you go and do all the write-offs and all of that you look like you were broke and so they're not finna buy they're not giving you no house with the broke version of your income tax so make sure your income tax shows the best version of you not the broke version you do not need a big lump sum of income tax back that year you're gonna buy your house you're gonna save your money I'll do what you have to do but don't write off all that stuff because it ain't gonna look good it ain't gonna look good and you're not gonna get approved but um I I don't want this video to be very long. I just wanted to kind of touch bases on a couple things that can help you during the home buying process. Don't get discouraged when you're buying a home. Don't get discouraged. It, you know, you're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. You're going to cringe sometimes when you hear from your mortgage officer, your loan officer. You might cringe when you get a phone call from your realtor. Don't know what's going to happen. All of that. Just relax get through it, submit what you need to submit, stay honest, stay true and buy your home. And your first home might not be your dream home, but guess what? It's your home. Like you bought a house. Like that's just an accomplishment within itself. You it might not be a mansion, but you bought a house, you bought a piece of real estate. Real estate is forever going to always stick. You always going to have something if you have a piece of real estate. So I just hope this video was helpful. If it was helpful or if you have anything you want to add into the comments or just something that you learned from this video, drop it in the comments. Of course, I love interacting with you guys. Make sure that you like, comment, subscribe, click the notification bell so that you are notified every time I post a video and make sure that you watch the video when you're notified that I posted a video. <laughs> Make sure that you follow me on all platforms at Star Erica. That is S T A R E R I C K A. 
And also at the millionaire table, as a CEO, as the owner. Anyways, y'all, thank you so much for tuning in, millionaires. Have a great one.